And um, today we have with us Marianne um, Stella Croce, who I just met on Zoom today from the Thomas Moran, uh, Mary Nimno House and Studio. And we will also be having a tour with the chief curator, Richard Barons. Okay, so we're gonna do a dual event today. I'm at the Pollock Krasner House here in East Hampton. And the other site we're gonna visit at 4.30 is about a half hour, a, a half hour, about five miles south of where I am right now, okay? Before we get started, I'm gonna do a brief screen share so I know that everybody's on the same page and we have a little bit of an idea of who Pollock, um, Krasner, and the Morans were. But this is, here we are on the east end of Long Island in East Hampton. It's also called the Hamptons sometimes nowadays. And uh, it's always been a haven for artists ever since the Long Island Railroad could get people transported here in the late 1800s. And it's a spectacular, beautiful, beautiful area because it's surrounded by water, bays, oceans, inlets. So the light is incredibly bright. I especially like this program today because it's a really good comparison. What do these artists have in common? Okay, they're both inspired by nature, but they take very different approaches. Thomas Moran is looking at the view of nature and actually painting what he sees. He's repre it's representational painting. He's representing a view that's outside himself. And of course, this is imbued with emotion and spirituality. Can so here is uh, Mary Nimmo. And um, like Pollock, who was married to Lee Krasner, these women are really noted accomplished artists. You could say these couples were very accomplished artists. And in both cases, the women weren't well known throughout history because women were not written into the history books. So we are making these women more visible today. So here's Pollock and Krasner in the barn studio where I am. And Pollock has a completely different approach to painting. He's not painting what he sees outside himself. He's painting his energy, his emotions, his dreams, and he's literally letting it flow from a stick. He's completely using new materials, house paint. He's not even touching the painting. And of course, he takes the painting off the easel and puts it on the floor. And there's Lee Krasner sitting behind him. Pollock said, I am nature. Uh, Hans Hoffman had said to him, you know, why don't you paint nature? And he responded, I am nature, right? He is the forces of nature and they're flowing through him as he's painting. He's also called an action painter because the painting shows his action. This one is by Lee Krasner, her famous collage technique where she would cut up or rip up her former paintings and then reassemble them to make a brand new collage. This one is called Bull's Eagle. And it sort of suggests flight or autumn without a literal representation of birds or leaves, right? That's abstract expressionist. Pollock and Krasner, in terms of time period, were working here. They came out here in 1945. And this group of artists known as the abstract expressionists sprung up during that period, the 1940s into the 50s, and they put America on the map as the art capital in the world. It all happened right here on the East End. So let's take a look at what's in their barn studio, and then we'll go outside. I'll quickly tour you through the house. So here I am. This first room is um, used mainly for storage. So you have painting racks, and Lee Krasner's painting cart. Lee and Pollock didn't paint in here at the same time. There's a small room upstairs in the house that Pollock painted in the first year. Then he came to the barn and Lee used that room upstairs. And after his death in 1956, a year later, Lee came in here to paint. So there's some strange things. There's his skull. And Pollock took that from the Art Students League in New York City, where he was studying with Thomas Hart Benton. And um, 
Of course, the artists were learning anatomy, drawing the human figure. So when Pollock and Krasna both started out, they were drawing representation and painting representational traditional subjects. The still life, a figure, a landscape, even narrative storytelling painting. And gradually they go within to paint things that you can't actually see like emotions and energy, right? Uh, by the way, Lee did not go to the Art Students League. She studied at Cooper Union, okay? It's a very intimate look when you come here. We even have Lee's apron. It's as if you're visiting them. So I am gonna put on my spon spongy comfy slippers here because you are allowed to walk right into the barn studio. And as I said, you can visit the house. We have very limited uh, tours over the summer. So make an appointment if you want to come in person, pkhouse.org. Okay, so here's the barn studio and we have historic photos on the wall. And of course, the main attraction is this floor. This is where Jackson Pollock laid his canvas took the canvas off the easel and had his breakthrough doing drip painting. Now, why did he put it on the floor? Of course, gravity pulls the paint down so you have more control over the painting. And also he said, I work from all four sides similar to the Indian sand painters of the West. So there was no top and bottom. Pollock was moving all around the canvas, sometimes even stepping into the canvas. And by the way, um, he saw the Native American sand painters at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And they were dribbling sand down, right? And that was one of his inspirations. Uh, you could even, if you look closely, see his footprints. And uh, this floor is not a work of art. Pollock's art is very intentional. These are just the random drips and splatters. But it certainly gives you an idea of the artist's process, trial and error, right? As well as the location and how Pollock may have been inspired by the natural landscape, okay? This is a national landmark. And I'll tell you, I personally take great pride in the preservation of a barn where an artist created masterpieces with the most humble of materials. Not a, it's not a national landmark that has marble floors, right? It's not about material things in that sense. It's about ideas and creativity and creating a new kind of beauty, okay? So here's Pollock. This photo was taken by Hans Namath. And uh, you could also Google, there's several videos that Namath took as well. This was 1950, so you could see him doing his famous drip technique. Um, he wasn't using traditional art materials. He's using house paint. And he sometimes would even squirt the paint from basters or use the stick instead of stirring the paint in addition to stirring the paint, he would use the stick as a tool he took a workshop with the Mexican muralist Siqueiros when he was a young man in New York City. Siqueiros encouraged his students to work with non-traditional, even industrial materials. However, Siqueiros was painting murals and representational images, and so was Pollock at that time, but Pollock had a breakthrough where he's creating 100% abstract art. Now, what makes Pollock and Krasner and the abstract expressionists different than abstract artists like Kandinsky who came before them? Abstract expressionism is uniquely a very physical way of painting. It's dripping, it's scraping, it's tearing, it's cutting, it's staining, it's using your whole body, it's action painting, right? And it's like a release. But that's not to say it's not childlike in the sense that these artists were very skilled, very methodical painters. 
And Pollock was actually, when he painted, he painted very slowly and carefully. So um, I had told you that, um, well, a little bit about Pollock's success. During his own lifetime, Pollock became very famous thanks to Lee who managed his career. And this is Life Magazine, 1949. Is he the greatest living painter in the United States? So he was very famous, whoops. And um, Lee negotiated with Peggy Guggenheim, the art patron to give him a monthly stipend so he could work here and he didn't have to worry about money. Pollock was the primary breadwinner in the, the family, the couple. And um, Lee also negotiated with Peggy Guggenheim so they could buy this house. So everything was going well. You might say they are the epitome of the American dream. They have a house, a car, property, 1.56 acres, right? Everything is going well. However, sadly, Pollock was an alcoholic. He was sober for two years when he made his great works. And then he started drinking again. No one knows why exactly. And um, he did fall into a deep depression. And the last year of his life, he wasn't even painting. His behavior was also erratic at that time. But it's a myth that alcoholism fuels creativity. No, it actually really doesn't. Alcoholism destroys families and it makes a person very ill. It's a disease, right? And that was the case with Pollock. Pollock started a marital affair with Ruth Kligman. You can imagine the stress on Lee. She went to Paris to take a break. She was gonna come back. But sadly, while she was away, Pollock invited the mistress, Ruth, who invited her friend, Edith Metzger, to get into the car and go to a party. And um, they never made it to the party. They crashed into a tree on Springs Fireplace Road. Pollock was 44 years old. Lee came home, of course, and for a year she didn't paint. But then she did resume her painting in this barn. And here she's shown, you see all those beautiful artworks behind her. She pinned her canvases to the wall and she like Pollock was an action painter. Look way up there, see the splats? She was around my height, how'd she get up there? Well, the movement of her body and her brushes, it was like a dance of paint. Occasionally she would use a ladder but she preferred using her entire body. Lee became a successful artist in her own right. And um, she lived here until she was an older woman. And um, before she died, she arranged that this would become a museum under the auspices of Stony Brook University. And um, after she died, after this became a museum in 1987, the conservatives came in here. You could see in this photo, the barn was, the floor was covered with boards. You see that? The conservatives peeled off the paper and underneath was Pollock's floor preserved forever. So while the couple was still alive, and you can see this in this photo here, they renovated the barn, they winterized it, and they put these white boards over the floor. And that's why when you come to visit today, this floor is really exclusively Jackson Pollock's, right? Any questions up to this point, you can feel free to put them in the chat while I take these slippers off and we go outside, okay? I'm not clear who put the covering. Yeah, Pollock and Krasna put the floor covering on there when they were still alive. Okay, and then it remained that way. Lee was working in there and the floor was covered. Uh, they put it to renovate. You know, they winterized, the barn was just like a shell, right? So they fixed it up, okay? And it remained there. And I'll show you the boards, just a little trivia. Pollock's brother owned a, a board game company and it looked like this. You remember those type of games where you throw the little, uh, coin type thing. Well, it went out of business. So they were left with all these boards and they used them, they painted them white, used them to make 
floor tiles, and you'll see actually upstairs in Lee's room, the same boards were used. So let's go outside and I will show you around this spectacular property that I am really honored to be here today. Oh, I told you, look at this incredible light. This is Eastern Long Island. Now, let's picture this. When they moved here in 1945, this really was pretty much what it looked like. It was, but the surrounding area was different in that it was very, very rural. There were only 200 people in the town of the, uh, in the Springs, which is also known as East Hampton. And they were fishermen and farmers. And then there were these artists who were coming out here, buying houses, buying property because it was really inexpensive. All this property and the house they bought for $5,000. Today, this would be worth millions and millions of dollars, even not that because it's Jackson Pollock's house. The barn was originally there. That's Acabonic Creek in the background. And Pollock and his buddies moved it here so as to not block that view. And this is an outhouse because this was an old dilapidated farmhouse. There wasn't even plumbing in the house. So this was tough living. Lee said it was the hardest year of her life when she moved here. She was a city girl, born and raised in Brooklyn. So, um, you know, but there were many advantages for artists here. In addition to the spectacular beauty, they had more space, right? Um, they could hop on a train and get right back to New York City. And there was an overlay of an art community here of dealers, collectors, artists. So it's perfect, really. And it's affordable, right? You could still have a bohemian life here back then. So here's the house. And um, of course they fixed up the house, they put bathrooms in. And this house is renovated. I mean, it's restored to the point where Lee lived here because she was the last one living here. But many of the things were here from when Pollock was here. So I'll show you some of the art. We don't have a collection of like, um, you know, really famous artists on the walls, like the Friends, like de Kooning and all these people. Um, but this does show a, really a lot of diverse creativity. So this is a fish print and Lee Krasner's friend caught that fish, put it on the counter here, rolled ink onto the fish. You press paper against it, you peel it off and you get a print, right? That's Japanese fish printing. That's a tarpon, huge fish. He caught that in the bay. Over here, we have a sculpture made by Lee Krasner's nephew, Ronald Stein. And this is made from found objects, wood turnings, toys, right? Little toy soldiers, chess pieces. And this idea of constructing and repurposing found items, items is a major theme in modern art, right? And then you get to imagine it in your own way, right? It could be a castle, it could be a city. So it sparks your imagination. Way up at the top, there's that brown piece. This was actually a water fountain and it was exhibited at Guild Hall where they invited artists to make fountains in the backyard. Now you'll notice on the wall, these paintings. These were not here when they lived here. These are by Mary Abbott an abstract expressionist. And we have changing exhibitions that relate to Pollock and Krasner. So this is a temporary exhibit. You'll notice like Pollock and Krasner, what makes it abstract expressionism? Do you see the energy? Do you see the paint? Do you see the movement of the artist herself, right? It's the energy made visible, so to speak. So um, this is an anchor. They found this on the beach. And this is an example of ready-made art. You find an object and you call it art. 
You don't even have to have the artist's hand involved in the making of the art. So that can be challenging. Sometimes you might go to a museum, right? And you see uh, a pipe standing there. And it's, well, where, where's the artist's skill in that? It's more conceptual. So this is box art and Lee Krasner's studio assistant, Ben Bianchi made this. And again, you can see the use of recycled or found objects. This is their parlor. Simple living. I love coming here. Not only is it spectacularly beautiful, but it really puts you back into a bygone era, right? When life was simpler, especially on the east end of Long Island, right? It wasn't as touristy. It wasn't filled with consumerism as it is today. It's still beautiful and I'm thankful to be here. So on the second floor here, we do have a bathroom and there's a bathroom downstairs as well. And this is the guest room and you can see those two twin beds. Those were their marital beds, which Lee later moved them to create this guest room. And this was the master bedroom. And then of course, Lee lived here on her own until her death. And she also had an apartment in New York City. She did not remarry. Um, she wasn't a seamstress. This is just an example of her clothes. She did like to get dressed up sometimes, you know, and be fashionable, so to speak. And um, this is a portrait of Lee by Igor Pontanov, her boyfriend before she married Pollock. And you can see her nature collection. Lee was very inspired by nature. And like I said, like Pollock, she didn't copy nature, right? She painted the energy of nature and sometimes the forms of nature, but in an abstract way, simplifying shapes, simplifying colors, similar to Matisse. This is the small room that um, Pollock painted in the first year and then Lee painted here. What's special about this room is this amazing, amazing view. Look at that, see that? And all that land that goes, that brownish land that leads up to Akamana Creek, today that's a nature preserve. And Lee Krasner donated that. So she had incredible foresight to create the study center uh, to create that, you know, to donate to the nature preserve and also uh, to, to create an endowment where um, artists can apply for grants to support themselves. And that grant is active today. So if you're an artist, you can Google a Pollock Krasner grant and it'll bring you to the application. So we have a few minutes. Does anybody have any questions? Ideas, comments, let's see. Okay. Well, I am extremely grateful today to collaborate with the Moran Studio and House. I went there over the winter to see their Victorian holiday exhibition and I was blown away. I had never been there. And I think Richard must have been like, what's wrong with this lady? I just kept saying over and over again, I can't believe this. I can't believe how good this is. So um, I can't wait to go on the tour. We're gonna virtually zoom over to the uh, Moran studio and house. And Mary Ann, would you like to introduce Richard? Absolutely, thank you, Joyce. And thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, as with the Pollock Krasner Studio, we are giving you an abridged version of our tour today. Uh, we'll be open July 1st for our regular one hour tours. And so if you'd like to purchase your tickets, we are requiring advanced registration for that. You can visit our website at easthamptonhistory.org. The Thomas and Mary Nimmo Moran Studio um, is operated by the East Hampton Historical Society. 
And it's my pleasure to welcome our chief curator, Richard Barons, who'll be giving us the tour today. So just allow us to pivot a second. <laughs> Good afternoon. Welcome to the Thomas and Mary Nimble Moran studio. Um, this is a sort of a fun idea, I think, particularly starting with Pollock uh, and then ending with Thomas Moran, because it it's, will show you there are similarities and there are things that are so broadly different. Um, Thomas Moran was the first artist to build a freestanding building designed as a studio and cottage on the east end of Long Island. A few years later, uh, William Merritt Chase built one in the Shinnecock Hills, but this was one of the very first ones. And in after the Civil War, there was a movement towards a somehow finding something that was positive after such a devastating war, so many you know, brother fighting brother, et cetera, et cetera. And there was a, a desire to find something that people could grasp onto that was spiritual, uh, that also was essentially American. And that's when all of a sudden the whole idea of landscape painting in the 19th century began to change. One interesting feature I think about so many of these so-called Hudson River Valley School painters who started in the 1840s, 50s, and blossomed after the Civil War, is how many of them, in fact, were immigrants. And Thomas Moran was an immigrant, came over with his father from England. His later on, when he married Mary Nimmo, she was an immigrant. She came over to Philadelphia with her father, who was a weaver from, from uh, Scotland. So we have these people who are thrilled to be in America, and also are interested in visual arts, uh, usually going to the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts or some of them like Moran studying with his brother who became a famous painter really before Moran, young Moran was a teenager in Philadelphia that they looked at the landscape. When Moran started painting, he very much was what we would call an old school painter. He was not part of the Impressionist movement, even though by the 1860s, the Impressionists in Europe are painting en plein air out there with their canvases and their oil paint. Moran was very, very old fashioned, very much the old academy. And his brother Edward, who specialized in paintings of the ocean, uh, taught him to draw first, to do watercolors, to do sketches, and then go back to the studio and take the essence of whatever you have done. You might have done 15 watercolor sketches. You might have done two little oil sketches. You might have done some pencil sketches, may have written in what the colors were. You then go back to your studio and then you would create the painting. You would take the best aspects of each form. So even though it looks like Miranda's copying nature, he is being inspired by nature and he is making nature often way more glorious than it was at the day he saw it. He'll take the best sunset, the best shadow, the best tree, put it together and to make a conglomerate. We have a painting over here that was done by Moran, who was loved traveling. He loved to travel and all over the country and all over the world in reality. Uh, as a young man, he and his kid brother, Edward, uh, went off to England, and then later on, he and his wife, and then later on, his family traveled in Scotland and traveled uh, through Rome and stayed almost half a year in Venice. And this painting, which was done in 1899, was done by Thomas Moran, who was very much inspired by the work of Turner, another artist who's in reality an abstract painter. There's no question about it. He's all about emotions, sublime, catching the storm, catching the volcano, or what have you. And when Thomas and his kid brother went to uh, England uh, after the Civil War, they saw one of the first Turners that came, that went, came to the National Gallery 
And he was infatuated with Turner and how Turner used impasto, how he used abstracted areas and then pulling out your details of this painting if you don't recognize what it is. You stand back like an impressionist painting and you can see what it is, but he never became the great colorist that the impressionists were. But here you could see the sky and the forms. And this painting was done a year after he saw this and he filled four or five sketches, sketchbooks filled with watercolors and drawings and came back to his studio. Um, in this instance, it could have been this studio he also had a studio in New York, and later on he had a studio out in California. Um, and he was very successful. He was very successful before he built this studio. He had been most famous for going out west and going to the Grand Canyon and being the first visual art artist to go to the Grand Canyon. He came back with all his sketchbooks and sketches, did a huge painting, took it to New York City. People were, couldn't believe the Grand Canyon looked anything like that. How could it be? Look at those colors. It was a large painting, as big as, not quite as big as some of Pollock's, but almost as big, probably up this tall and about this wide. It was bought by the federal government, and it was one of the inspirations for creating the first national park, which is Yellowstone. But when, by the time he and his wife and three children moved out from, they started out in New Jersey and then they bought a townhouse in New York and came over to, uh, some friends came out here in the 18, early 1870s and said, you've got to go out. You've got to go out to Montauk. You've got to get out to Montauk. So he and his wife were invited to go out to Montauk. They immediately fall in love with East Tampa. They love the color. They love everything about it, the old houses. They rent for a while, and then for a few thousand dollars, they buy this piece of property. And he designs his studio. Uh, he also uses parts of buildings that were being torn down. New York is always being torn down and rebuilt. So windows, like this huge window over here, some of the woodwork, stained glass windows over there, were all put together like a assemblage. And many of us consider the studio, which is what he called the building, they were here using about six months out of the year. Uh, we think it's really his sculpture. So let's walk around and take a look at some elements. Uh, there's a fireplace mantle over here, which is from a building that was being torn down in New York and probably, oh, just about the time that they moved out here in 1884, they bought the property in 86. And this is from a house that was built probably about 1790. And then when you come over here to this bay window, which is totally a creation of the artist, he gets this column somewhere from some building. This little section over here, the little plinth there is, is made out of a cigar box because it, he was the architect. There was not an engineer. Uh, there was not really a contractor. He contracted with some of the local carpenters to build this building. They must have found it somewhat frustrating because I think he was always adding on, oh, this might work a little better. But the window here and the front door and several other windows, he purchased from a candy store that was being torn down on Lower Broadway, brought those out here. Some architects think that this may be the first house where plate glass windows were used in a private residence rather than in a store. So we'll walk a little further over. Usually in the summertime, there's going to be an exhibit up. So the walls will be covered with paintings and drawings. This summer, our exhibit is going to be on the three Morans, Edward, Mary, and Thomas, and their relationship with the ocean. So there's going to be paintings of the ocean and boats here. This was the studio, which today we would look at and think was probably the living room, but this was really the place where Moran worked. Um, he did some very large canvases and very small canvases. He had two or three easels all around. But in the evening, often they would invite people in. They'd put all the furniture against the wall and they'd have dances. The whole family was very musical. This was their private dining room. They had of curtains and also rugs hanging on the wall. So it could make it a little private. 
And some of the furniture that they brought, like the big sideboard over there, was probably something that they found on the street when a building was being torn down in the Chelsea area where they lived in New York. Um, they used unusual materials such as grass cloth for the dado over there. These columns that support the ceiling of the dining room are really from front doors from a house that was built in about 1810. And the balcony was the family living room. And upstairs, there's a, a number of bedrooms. Uh, off the balcony is a room where Moran would keep his paintings that he was working on. Because he might work on five or six paintings at the same time. And he knew that when he invited people in, that people would touch them. So he would put them up in a storage area while they dry using oil paints. Some of them would take almost two or three weeks to dry. And then he'd bring it back down and work on it. So he's always working on paintings, always trying to perfect light. Um, someone once said that they came in and visited with Mr. Moran and he looked out the window and he said, I've got to capture that light. And supposedly immediately did a sketch. And then the gentleman who left us this interesting story said he came back in a few weeks and there was the painting with the sky that he saw from the window. His wife, Mary Nimmo Moran was extremely talented. We don't really know if anyone knew at the time that she was quite talented, um, but she was. And how did he find out after he married her? He had so many jobs. He was making money both being an easel painter, but also during that period, he was an illustrator. And you know he would do drawings that he would then send off, uh, be paid for, and they'd go off to the wood engraver to be used in magazines. And he needed someone to do some of the fine work on it. So he taught her how to draw, then he taught her how to paint. He said he was very impressed. And she very quickly adapted to a form of art that probably she didn't enjoy oil painting and watercolor as much as she loved etching. Now, Moran, doing all his landscape drawings outside, then coming in here and painting. What does his wife do? She takes her copper plates outside, even on a boat sometimes. She does her etchings on plein air. So they have a freedom and a vitality that sometimes people don't find in the finished work of Moran. And it's funny, every once in a while, Moran would do a, a painting where there was a little more impasto, a little more impressionistic. And the critics would always stamp on him saying, no, don't do that, you know, so it is a living after all, right? <laughs> so when they built the studio originally, for the first couple of years, there was no kitchen. As they began to entertain more as their kids and their cousin and uh, other relatives, of, in three generations, there were 20 artists in the Moran family. A lot of people coming to visit. Uh, William Merritt Chase was a good friend and you can just go down the list of artists from the period and either they knew one another in New York or they knew one another out here. So he put a kitchen on and you go through this sort of funky little space here. And this area back here is the kitchen. Now we don't show you a kitchen with stove in it. We think that there are other historic sites around here that you can see a Victorian kitchen in. We need a space um, because it's a home. It wasn't built as a museum. We need a space to show off the artwork, just like at the, at the Pollock, Krasner. And so that's why we did not put the kitchen back. It had been taken away. Um, obviously, at Pollock Krasner, the kitchen is still there, so obviously we keep it. But in our instance, we had the pleasure of not having to think about the kitchen. So the windows, the floors, and everything is what the kitchen would have looked like. Uh, but we use it for display space. And it's really a great place for etchings because etchings are something that you really need to get up close to, to experience. And let's, let's take a little, let's not look at this one. Let's go over here so Mary Nimmo gets a chance to shine. And here is Nap Heeg from Fresh Pond, done by Mary Nimmo Rand in 1884. And it's one of, I think, one of her most superb uh, etchings with this old bridge. And because she had 
learned etching from her husband, not at a school, she tended to experiment more, like putting a lot of ink on and then brushing off some so you get some of the color here and then carefully keeping areas very dark. And then sometimes she would do a print where she would darken the sky. It would be the same plate after all. And like most printmakers of this period in the 1880s, Mary Nimmo Moran dies in 1898, her husband dies in 1926, um, she did not number prints. We have no idea how many etchings there were in this particular ed edition, but we do know that we've seen four or five of the same etching and oftentimes the colors are slightly different. Sometimes the ink is blacker. Here it's more brown. And then look at the one below, which is a tiny version of a larger etching that she did, which was called Twilight East Hampton, done in 1882 when they were renting out here in the summer, not when they already had a studio. And the print was so popular that when she was invited to join the New York uh, Etching Guild, they chose this print for her to make a miniature version as a Christmas gift for their members. And this is, you know, tiny, tiny and has all this wonderful, lustrous, you know, tones and colors of a sunset. So uh, we would like to invite you to come and see us. We have a Victorian garden. There's some outbuildings which are somewhat entertaining. One thing we have here is an etching press, very much like the one that the brands would have used. We think that they did most of the printing in the New York studio. Uh, but this one is of the 1860-1870 period. And we'd love to have you come back. And we think it's a great day to come here, go to Paula Krasner, maybe start at Paula Krasner like we did today, and come here because here we've got a very wealthy, famous artist who builds an expensive studio, which is a very different contrast with Jackson Pollock who is just beginning to be terribly famous when Peggy Guggenheim lends the money and gets him out here to dry him out, which I guess works temporarily. So we hope that you can come and see both of these amazing art studios and get an introduction to East Hampton, the American Byzantine or, or uh, the American uh, center of art. Thank you, Richard. Does anybody have any questions for us? I see some in the chat box. Hold on one second. How recently was the house inhabited? The house was lived in up until about probably 15 years ago. Um, it belonged to the Morans until the 1940s when it was bought by another artist from New York, um, Condi Lamb. Um, and he was a professional artist. He was mostly into graphic arts. He and his wife and son lived here, and then it was left to Guild Hall, and it was taken over as a restoration project by a new organization which was developed just to restore the building. And we've now been open, I think this is probably our fourth year. Are there any other questions? I have a question. Um, who managed Thomas Moran's career? Did the wife manage the career or who did the business? How, well, how did that that's work? a really good question. Um, <laughs> uh, behind every living man is a strong woman. Um, there is no question that Mary Nemo Moran uh, managed her husband's career. She certainly was involved with the book work, uh, correspondence, uh, of course, she was also a wife. She was also a mother of three children. They were relatively uh, teenagers and older by the time they moved out here. But no, um, <clears throat> she is amazing considering that today she's being really reinvented. People are looking back upon what, what period she worked in, which is called the etching, uh, well, really it's sort of the etch etching revival. Um, but during her period, she was really one of the most famous um, etchers in America, and she also was famous in Europe. She, she was, in fact, 
made a member of the London Guild of Etchers, which was extremely prestigious, and she was the first woman to become a member of that. Uh, so she was very famous for her etchings, and also her husband etched. <laughs> so we have quite a number of etchings by both artists in our collection, but today, Moran, Thomas Moran is probably known for his Western paintings, even though he did splendid paintings out here. But no, Mary Nimble Moran was imperative for the life of Later on, when she dies, um, uh, Ruth, the, one of the sister, takes over and helps manage her dad's career. And she's the one who really worked hard to try to get an artist to buy this property um, so it would still be an artist's studio before she died. There's another question. Were there also other women artists in the larger extended Moran family, their daughter? Oh, their daughter, not so. Um, but certainly uh, one of the one of his his brothers um, had a, a had a, a wife who was extremely talented. And there are probably and there's some other sketches. I mean, we know that a number of the Moran women sketched, uh, but more often than not, um, they seem to have you know given that up when they married, except in, in this instance. And also, it's interesting to note that some of Thomas, one of Thomas's brothers became noted only as an etcher, Peter, and another became one of the most famous photographers of the period. In fact, ended up going on expeditions out west long after Thomas Moran's first expedition. Any other questions for us? We hope that you'll come visit us this summer again, easthamptonhistory.org, our tickets are available. And we thank you all for coming on our virtual tour today and thank the Pollock Krasner House for the invitation to join them in this joint program. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Richard. That was so good. You were fabulous. <laughs> Ah, uh, we're mutually flattering each other. Well, this is just a win-win because these, these sites are amazing. And um, I did notice on your website, do you have like a book club about Hampton's Bohemia? That book? Yes. So the second Thursday in May at 7 p.m., uh, we're hosting a virtual book discussion on Hampton's Bohemia and Helen. Um, the executive director of the Paul Krasner House will be joining us. She's the author of the book. So if you just go on to our website under events, you can register there. Um, again, virtual program. And so we're looking forward to that discussion. Oh, so nice meeting you. I hope that we meet in real life one day. Yes. And um, thank you again. And um, I think the Hamptons Bohemia is a really good uh, follow up because it's really about the history of arts in this area. So it's it's a great tie in. So have a wonderful day, everyone. And thank you, thank you again.